So first, uh, examples of IMB syllabic roots. Kazu, uh, three, which has a, a Kirpri syllable, which you often find in, uh, in, in many Chinese, in many modern Chinese dialects, in particular in Mandarin. And uh, it's sometimes disguised. It's sometimes, at times, it has been reinterpreted as meaning as as being gold dog. So it seems to mean dog flea, but then actually it's it's really a it's really a reinterpretation of that uh, pre-syllable here, which is not which is not a prefix. Another example is the word for mushroom that we were telling you uh, this morning. We're telling you about this morning. Uh, this word actually makes it into modern standard Chinese is a disyllable. It's still it's still it's mogu, mogu uh, mushroom. But uh, as we, the, the, the first syllable has been there for a long time, as you can see from the fact that it has a, a prenasal in in the loan to Hmongyang, and it has a, uh, a softened initial in Ming, as we saw this morning. And there's no, it doesn't seem to be any, I mean, it doesn't fit, uh, it doesn't seem to be any kind of prefix. I mean, it doesn't fit any of the prefixes that, that we've identified. So uh, we don't treat it as a prefix. So we assume that in such words, the minor syllable was not a prefix. And we use a dot to separate a minor syllable that we cannot positively identify as a prefix. So that's what we've done in these forms. Katsu with a dot. And this is another example, the word for uh, woman. Uh, and moku, uh, mushroom. Now, if you see a hyphen between a minor syllable and a root, that means we think it's a prefix. If you see a dot, that means we don't think it's a prefix. It might be a prefix, but if so, it's a prefix that we haven't identified. <laughs> OK, so uh, both kinds of roots had only one stress beat. And that stress beat fell on the last syllable of the IMB syllable and on the unique syllable of the new syllable. Uh, so in case in the case of IMB syllables, this conferred a weak, strong rhythm, an iambic rhythm to the IMB syllable, something like tada, okay? weak, strong, tada, short pre-syllable and a strong, stressed, uh, major syllable, main syllable. In the script, we believe that what Chinese characters wrote were <laughs> words. And so it follows from what I've just said that there were two kinds of words. Some words that were strictly monosyllables, and others that were more than a monosyllable, that had a minor syllable, pre-syllable. Okay. So, the uh, implication, uh, the consequence of what I've said is that some characters write words that were a syllable, a main syllable preceded by a minor syllable. There are also interesting consequences in, in versification uh, that is specific mostly in the Shijing, in the Book of Odes. We think that uh, all Chinese poetry was not syllable counting like French poetry, but it was foot counting like Latin poetry or, or certain kinds of English poetry, uh, so that a foot could consist of a monosyllable or an iambi syllable. Okay? They counted for one foot, each of them. So not one and a half versus one, but one and one. They really were counting stresses. So a four-character verse could consist of four monosyllables, four IMB syllables, or any combination of, of up to four mono and IMB syllables. There has been, a, um, when I reconstructed uh, uh, IMB syllables in, uh, corresponding to old Chinese uh, words and written by one character, uh, Ding Pang Xin uh, criticized this, saying it's not possible that uh, 
you know, having one character consisting of uh, writing two syllables, writing disyllables, basically. Because look, in, in the shooting, we see all those uh, stanzas consisting of four characters. So four characters, one, two, three, four, all these lines, one, two, three, four, that must mean they were, not, they were monosyllabic. Well, King's conclusion would be true only if they were counting syllables, but if they were counting stresses, it's not necessarily true. Okay, now let's uh, move on to uh, root structure. Uh, now I'm going to start talking about the main, the main syllable of IMB syllables, the structure of the main syllables of IMB syllables, which is the same thing as the, stru the structure of monosyllables. Okay, so in fact, main syllables, whether monosyllabic or the second part of an IMB syllable. Uh, the structure we're arguing for is this. So C's mean consonants, and V's mean vowels. So that main syllable had three consonantal positions, one vocalic position, actually four uh, consonantal position, including, including that one. And the um, parentheses indicate positions that did not have to be filled. That means that sequences that did not have these positions filled were still were lawful, were acceptable for Chinese monosyllables or main syllables. Okay. Uh, okay. So what was what an old Chinese main syllable had to have was an, an initial consonant, C1, and a vowel, V. Okay. This was not, you had to have this, and you had to have this. The rest was uh, optional in a sense. I mean, you understand I'm not saying that uh, you could have them or not. I mean, this, the same word had, it was, they were not optional in the same word. I mean, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Okay. So, uh, let's begin with the initial. The C1 here. So it was obligatory. And all consonants of all Chinese could occur in that position. And what the important thing to know about all Chinese initials was that there were two types. Uh, 34 consonants in each type, very parallel. Okay, type A and type B. Now there has been, as Bill explained this morning, there has been a lot of discussion as to what the, this, what the distinction between type A and type B was. Uh, we tend to think that the correct interpretation is that provided by Norman in his 1993 paper. 95? Uh, type A was pharyngealized and type B was not, was non-pharyngealized. Uh, what does pharyngealized mean? Pharyngealized means that you pronounce the consonant while at the same time constricting the pharyngeal walls, the walls of the time. So you will have a, a, the uh, cavity above your larynx is going to be reduced in size, and this is going to give the uh, this is going to give to the consonant a, a special uh, acoustic uh, quality. Uh, Pharyngealized consonants are known from a number of languages, including Arabic, where they're called emphatic, uh, but they're also known from other languages, some in, some in East Asia, in particular the language uh, Nanai, which is a Tungusic language spoken in, 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 uh, in Russia. Uh, the Nanai are known as uh, the gold, also. and if you've seen the film, uh, Dersi Uzala. Uzala was 
in my mind. Uh, so what would a pharyngealized P sound like? Let's say pharyngealized PA. I don't know. I'm going to try it more. And a non-pharyngealized PA would be PA. So PA versus PA. TA versus TA. KA versus KA. All right, something like that. All right, so how do we, how to write then, as Bill told you this morning, for the present, we write type A consonants, that is the pharyngealized ones, <coughs> as double consonants. Uh, this is a way of indicating that they are marked, that they are, that they sometimes, so, somehow are more than a non-pharyngealized consonant. But we do not exclude that in future, uh, we may simply use a, a international phonetic alphabet symbol for pharyngealized fricative, which we will put just after the initial consonant. Okay, so. Excuse me, and it's only the first letter of the, in the spelling. Right, only the first letter in the spelling, and the first letter that's on the that's not in the root. That's not superscript. Okay. But we, mm -hmm. if, as you as you will see. Uh, okay, so, all right, this is a, ah, Hick. Mm. Oh, your phone, phone problem. Mm -hmm. You don't have dentia on this? Yeah, I do. Well, well, we can tell them where it is. We'll fix how, do it. I, how do I go back? Uh, try mm. bottom uh, right, there's an arrow key. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's this thing is a. Yeah. These are A's. Capital G's. These are, these are A's. A's. Yeah. And these are velar nasals. Velar nasals. They are n, n, and this is capital G. I don't understand why it does that. Okay, so uh, 34 consonants here, all doubled. So you see we do not reduplicate an H, indicating aspiration, and uh, we do not reduplicate an H, indicating a voiceless, a voiceless nasal. And in the case of uh, Africans, we do not reduplicate. We, we just reduplicate, reduplicate of the, of the first of the two. That's just a thought of thing. So, what kind of consonants do you get here? Well, you get uh, bilabials, points of articulation, places of articulation, bilabials, no labiodentals, alveolars, alveolar stops and nasals, alveolar, alveolar uh, sibilants, laterals, rotics, velars, labial velars, uvulars and labial uvulars. Okay. From the point of view of uh, um, manner of articulation, you get stops, there are three kinds of stops, but as, as in Middle Chinese, uh, voiceless stops, voiceless aspirated, voiced. Right? Only one fricative, S. And that's, that's very noteworthy and typologically unusual to have so few fricatives. So, um, okay, so no F, no G, no, no, nothing else. Neither, only one, and it's voiceless. Nasals, uh, we have plain nasals, voiceless nasals, na, na, na. Liquids, we have laterals and R's, and voiceless liquids. Okay. Now type B is exactly the same. Exactly the same. No, no difference except non non All Right, so that's that's sixty-eight. 
to make exact numbers. Okay, so that was the C1 position. Now let's let's look at the C2 position, which is also called the medial position. Now what do you get in medial position? Very simple. It's op first it's optional, so you don't always get something, but when you do get something, it's always an R. Right? So it's a position that can be filled only by an R. Next position is the main vowel. What you see here is a B. And that is, a big, is obligatory. Because you've got all syllables that got to have it. And there are six vowels, as Bill was telling you this morning, just the six vowel system. And these are the six vowels. So three high vowels, two mid, one A, one O and one low vowel up. Very simple and uh, typologically natural and widespread uh, vowel system. There is a little, there is a certain question whether this schwa here shouldn't be a central vowel, whether it's really a high vowel on the same, at the same height as uh, E and O. In which case we should write it as uh, Bardai. But remember Bill's uh, dislike of Bardai's in general. So we, uh, we use a schwa, and uh, Bill still thinks that it's, it's a I high vowel. I still think it's, it's high, a high yes. vowel. Okay, so. And Chen Tang Chang Fang writes this rotated M. You know, the, yeah, you uh, an which it would be another way to do it, but I'm afraid that people would mess that up too. An unrounded U. Yeah, that would be another way of doing it. Next comes the coda. Uh, the coda is a consonant. It's the C3 here. It's optional in the sense that not all syllables have, not all syllables, not all lawful syllables have a coda. And uh, the consonants that can occur in that position is the list of them is restricted, is limited. You have, you can have four stops, P, T, K, and a labial velar uh, K. Only three nasals, M and N. No nasal corresponding to W, K, as Bill was telling you this morning. Oh no, you were saying? I didn't mention that. Uh, no, you, you, I think it, no, you were talk, talking about middle school. Mm -hmm. Uh, other sonorants were R, J, and W. Uh, R, J, and W. So, one, two, three, four, seven, and ten. Ten, uh, ten consonants can occur in that C3 position. Right? Uh, this PowerPoint, by the way, is on the website in the Monday folder. So. We should probably fix the fonts and do that. Yeah, I don't know what to do. Anyway, uh, you will tell me if you have problems with the with the fonts mm -hmm. in the PowerPoint. Okay, the postcode. The last position is the postcode, and you have it here. As you can see, it it can only be occupied by the other stuff. Not all syllables have a vowel stop, but if you, uh, but some do. Yes. But there is one uh, one condition for having a vowel stop. The condition is that either you do not have a C3, and in that case the vowel stop, the vowel stop comes immediately after the vowel, or the C3, the C3 is a sonorant. If the C3 is a stop, you cannot have a global stop. Okay, so the global stop can only follow a preceding sonnet, either a vowel or, a, or N and N, 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 R, Y, or W. 
Any questions? Is it well, just one small question? Is it pathologically common to have only CDs fracture? I mean, not, for instance, the V that we have balancing cerebral structures on the vowel, which is a little bit of so You always have a consonant opening. Yeah, I, th I think it's pretty common, uh, of course, linguistically, to have mm -hmm. languages that do not allow uh, vowel onsets and the initials. The post-coda never occurs after plusy. Yeah, mm -hmm. after stops, you have to uh, after stop. 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 On a, on a changé ça. Oui, on a même tout à fait d'accord. Si je peux vous poser une question, une petite question. Ce truc que tu as avec le dot précédent, ce truc qui ne peut pas être identifié comme un préfix, tu n'as pas l'idée de ce que c'est Tu n'as pas le préfix. C'était une partie de la route. C'était une partie de la route. C'était une consonne qui était une partie de la route. C'est une partie de la route. An island is in other groups. But any particular meaning attached to it? It's just part of the root. It's just, uh, it, it doesn't have a meaning of its own. If mm. it, it had a meaning of its own, we would say, it would, we would say it's either another morpheme yeah. or it's a prefix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just part of the root. Are there other languages which have a similar postcode with only a lot of stuff? which can only come after something else. Well, I don't know if it's after, but uh, I think uh, you have something similar in Vietnamese, which can, uh, you can have this kind of thing, but in the same subset, I believe, that is, it doesn't occur with uh, plosive codas, but it occurs with all the others. Wait. Why you type A, you don't type a voice that predicts that the uh, it's type A and type B. It's not a difference between type A and type B. It's there were no voice fricatives in in old Chinese. Uh, the only fricative there was was an S. So why uh, maybe uh, presumably I mean <laughs> if they had, it, there must have been voice fricatives of, uh, in the ancestors of, of that language at some point in the past, but how, how long you have to go before you encounter your first voice fricative is before the demande au bon Dieu. And what happened to it? <laughs> Well, in fact, uh, Old English uh, did not have a voicing distinction, a phonemic voicing distinction in uh, fricatives. Uh, they were voiced intervocalically and they were voiceless initially. So there was no, I mean, there, was only, there were several of them, but there was uh, no voicing distinction. So if it was a if it was beginning, it would be an F, and if it was in the middle, it would be a V. And then the reason we have it now is because of, of uh, mostly because of loan words from French. I think the real typological oddity here is, is not so much the fact of not having voiced fricatives, it's really the fact of having so few fricatives, of having only one fricative. That's, that's, that's really, that's typologically unusual. But languages that only have voiceless fricatives are, 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 are common. Well, last question, most probably you're going to talk about it, but um, now that you have a complete consonant in Dantry vowel and then to, does it look like anything in Zunichi? I think as a language would it fit into any particular group family reconstructions or project to that environment or occasion. There were so many proposals, I don't know what to uh, Well I don't think you would assign a language to a family on the basis of its uh, word structure, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, but does it look like anything in Zunichi? It has the it has the it has the, the, the regional look. Mm -hmm. uh, that you find in conservative to the German languages, 
and also in Austroasiatic. Mm -hmm. uh, now, languages like Miao Yao and Tai Kai have mm -hmm. been so influenced, so so yeah, so influenced by Middle Chinese that they look like Middle Chinese. Mm -hmm. But Austroasiatic, which has not been influenced by by Middle Chinese, mm -hmm. still looks like that. Mm -hmm. And the Austronesian languages do not look like that because they have real disyllables, mm -hmm. okay? but it's not, if you assume that the first syllable of Austronesian disyllables reduce, mm -hmm. then you get something like that. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, the one difference is that in Tibetan-Burman, uh, Tibetan-Burman is to reconstruct only two series of stops. Mm -hmm. They reconstruct voiced and voiceless stops, B, B, K, B, B, G. They do not reconstruct aspects. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's one difference. Uh, either Chinese got its aspects secondarily after splitting from Tibetan Burman, or Tibetan Burman lost its aspects, one or the other. That's, that's, one, that's one important difference. And regionally also, you, only, you usually only get uh, two, uh, two series, Australian mm -hmm. only two, Austronesian only two, uh, so Chinese is special. Mongyan has all three. Mongyan has all three, but uh, interestingly, as we will see tomorrow, there are Chinese loans to Mongyan, where Chinese is an aspirant and Mongyan is unable to render the aspirant. So, okay, so we've talked. Uh, other questions? Now we've talked about the main syllable of uh, IMB syllables. Now we'll, let's talk about the. We've talked about the main syllables of IMB syllables and the only the unique syllable of monosyllables. Now what we what remains for us to talk about is the minor syllable of IMB syllables. Now that's much simpler. And basically, what you have is a consonant which is the minor syllable initial consonant, C0, followed by a schwa. Okay, so there's no, no choice of vowels. Only one vowel is possible, and it's a schwa. The list of consonants that you can have in C0 position is also very simple. Uh, well, it's not, an, it's not a completely, it's not a fully, it's not a solved, it's not a resolved question because, as you will see, um, minor syllables fell in the evolution to Middle Chinese. So we don't have a lot of evidence on that. So the evidence we have is sometimes indirect. And uh, so we may have, we may not, we may have missed some of the consonants that appear as C0. But, so far, we are pretty uh, confident that at least you have P, T, K, S, M, and N. At least those. Perhaps others. So at times we know that there was a, a pre-syllable, a, pre a minor syllable, for instance, in, when, we, when we see that mean, as a softened initial that tells us there was a minor syllable, but we don't necessarily know what the consonant was. And when that happens, we use a C to write the initial consonant. Example, the word for women, where we know that there was a, a syllable, but we don't know what it was. Okay, any questions on, on this? All right, uh, now we've... Uh, Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> when the consonant of the minor syllable fell, did it leave uh, a trace or...? Well, it left a trace in the mean. Uh, but it did not leave a trace in Middle Chinese. It sometimes leaves a tr it sometimes remains in modern Chinese dialects, including in, in Mandarin. Like Mogu, 
Like Like uh, Kotsar. Or like uh, Kotsar. Do you have an idea why some words it's still in Azerbaijan physically? It's very li li liable to remain in very colloquial words and to disappear in less colloquial words. That is, the, the more you know, the more literary a word is, and the more likely it's going to be to represent the uh, Middle Chinese uh, reading tradition, or you know, the, the literary tradition. The literary traditions uh, tradition uh, has done away with these forms. But you see, uh, moku, mm -hmm. mushroom, and kotsa uh, fi mm -hmm. are very colloquial words. Words you know, that are not not really city words. Uh, well, another question here, yeah, now you do not have maybe all the inventory of minor of consonants which can appear in minor syllables, but do you have an idea of the ratio of correspondence between monosyllabic and lambisyllabic words in the language group? I'm afraid it's too, too soon for that. We, we can't give a... Yeah. I would say... Well, it's, part, it's complicated by the fact that we do have reduced uh, forms, so some words probably appeared in both forms. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing we can measure is the uh, proportion of softened consonants in mm -hmm. I think there are about 300 items or something like that. That's just a wild guess. Uh, but, of course, they're not all, we're not always able to do and the field work hasn't necessarily been thorough and so forth, so there may be some that have, are not known. Well, certainly the, the, the main type is monosyllabic, mm -hmm. so we can say that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what Bill has now mentioned also is that there was a possibility for words to have a younger syllabic form, also for monosyllabic words, there was some kind of variation? No, what, what, so I'm going to talk about that now. So far, we have uh, talked about two, two kinds. The, monosyllabic and iambisyllabic, but there was also a reduced iambisyllabic type, that is, an iambi, uh, iambisyllabic type which had lost uh, its schwa, okay? Uh, for instance, in the case of uh, this word here, you, well, the schwa would be lost and the initial C, suppose it's a T, well then you would have something like to go, right? Uh, so there was only one syllabic peak, one, only one vowel, and the pre-initial and the initial formed a complex consonant, consonantal onset. For instance, the word for needle, we think was a reduced kind of syllable, pronounced something like uh, Now, there was a, although, We think that full and reduced are syllables with a variant pronunciation in old Chinese. The same word could have two variants. The same I and the syllabic word could have two variants, full and reduced. Uh, maybe these were stylistic or social variants. But the two types had very different evolutions into Middle Chinese. Uh, and this is reminiscent of work that Michel Ferlis has done in Laos with uh, languages Nyahen and, uh, La and is it Laven? Uh, where the same protoform has two very, uh, very different evolutions in, in, in two very closely related languages. Uh, yes. One, one just to this was going very quickly, so we do not reconstruct initial consonant clusters. Each thing which looks like a cluster you would either interpret as a reduced um, young syllabic form or... Well, we do have uh, R clusters. Uh -huh. We have R clusters, yes. But uh, um, I suppose all of them... Uh, yeah, but all the reduced time uh, syllabic forms have, have true, true clusters. I mean, they're true consonant clusters. The vowel falls, and the two consonants come into contact, and the cluster is formed, which is going to uh, uh, reduce 
mm -hmm. in various ways into Middle Chinese. Mm -hmm. In this case, in the case of Nido, what happened is that the T displaced the Q. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the word evolved as if it was from Old Chinese dun. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. However, you can see from the from the phonetic here that there was that there really was uh, something which was not t. Mm -hmm. So they evolved differently to Middle Chinese, as I, as I just said. The reduced kind formed a cluster. The cluster simplified in different ways. In the case of Mido, the first, the, the pre-syllabic consonant, one, one out. But in other cases, it's more complex. You have a, a cluster is formed, and the cluster is simplified in, in other ways. Uh, while in the full IMB syllabic type, the pre-syllable was simply lost. It just fell. Okay? In the Guangyun, you do not have a word that has a... You do not have a character that is not a monosyllable. All the characters in the Guangyun are monosyllabic. Okay? So, in that tradition, all pre-syllables fell. But of course, at the same time, in living dialects, they were still there, and they are still there today. So you really, from that, you really see that the Guangyun is a, a represents a, a reading. It's a reading pronunciation, a reading tradition, a literary tradition. If I can ask another question, can you mention it? But so, what was the character standing for um, when it is a younger syllabic word? Would it include also the minus syllable yeah, in the yeah. character? Yeah, so there's something so. which can be seen also on the phonetic, on the structure of the character, we can somehow get an, an idea that there is some, some minus syllable there. Yeah, uh, for instance, the, uh, you know, Joe, mm -hmm. the word nine, uh, is a drawing for an, for an arm with, uh, with a bend, and it, it represents the elbow. Uh, the word for the words for nine and elbow are homophonous in some together Ghanaian languages, mm -hmm. as in Garo, it's, it's school, the, both, the two are school. Mm -hmm. uh, so nine served as a phonetic for words that had ku, but they, there are several phonetics for ku. In this, in chio, nine was used preferably for those words that had a T before the T. Before the, the, okay, so you have, so the word for elbow itself uses the geophonetic, it's jo. And here you see the T, the T wins out in Middle Chinese. You get a cluster, it's, it's a, it's a, I think it's T R. Yeah, yeah, it's T R. So uh, we, we don't have cool. any, any way to get a T R Unless there's a T there, basically. The Middle Chinese TR, so in order for Middle Chinese T, in order for you to get Middle Chinese TR, you need a T in Old Chinese. But the phonetic tells you there's a K. So Old Chinese must have been Kukruk, which is very close to Jiao. And in the same theory, you get uh, I'll show the chow. We would also do the And that's that's a middle Chinese T S Y H. No, no it's D Z Y. But it's the same deal. Okay, well you, you need a dental stop there anyway. You need an alveolar stop there. And they use the chow phonetic because it was a tuk, not just a cut. Okay. Other questions? I was wondering about the schwa. Yeah. Uh, because if it's not a schwa, isn't it strange that it should fall as a schwa? If it's more like an RIO, it doesn't 
really matter. It is in the cases where you've got this constant cluster forming with a schwa forming the way, but if it's not really schwa because it seems to be a type of more like a part I isn't this rarer? Well, I think uh, <coughs> if you want to, you can say that it's a uh, uh, that, schwa, that, the, that this vowel had a mid uh, variant in that position, but the crucial thing is that there's only one vowel there. So uh, you don't always have the same vowel system in minor syllables well, as it's known. Right, as in okay, uh, so full syllables. That so maybe it was yeah, we, we could write it as a schwa, we could write probably anything, but the point is there only one, there's only one of them. Okay, continue. So they evolved differently to Middle Chinese, but they also evolved differently to Ming. As in Ming, the uh, minor syllables produced uh, softened Ming initially. Okay, so we suppose that what happened, uh, the softening was not, was not intervocalic voicing, but it combined with a phenomenon that you see in, the, in modern mean, northern mean dialect like Fujo, which is consonant softening or consonant emission in intervocalic position. And you see that in Fujo today. So the, the, the pre-syllable the schwa produced the environment for the mission to occur. Okay, so as I said, minor syllables were, were lost in the full and the syllabic type, and a cluster was formed in a reduced type. Now, this is a, a as by way of illustration, this is an entry in the uh, Wen Jiezi. It's the entry on on uh, writing brush. Now, uh, it's the entry on Yu, uh, which means writing brush, and we reconstruct root in our Chinese. So the Shu Wen says Lu, uh, writing brush, so Yi Shu Ye, that with which one writes, instrument for writing. And then the Shuan gives you a list of uh, local, regional equivalents. Uh, in Chu, Chu Weijin Yu, Chu Weijin Chu Weijin Yu, Yu. That is like this. Uh, in Wu, it is called Hu Lu, which we construct as Brut. And in the end, so perut is, okay, is in the full IND syllable. This looks like an IND syllable which has lost its minor syllable and which retains only the main syllable, as will happen in Middle Chinese. And indeed, this is the Middle Chinese form. Uh, in the end, that's in, in the region of, uh, of Beijing, it is called ut. And that's another thing. That's that's a that seems to be a uh, a case in which the uh, in which the uh, main syllable, sorry, the initial of the minor syllable and the initial of the main syllable have mer have fused, and only the p wins out. And Finally, in another in another entry, the entry for writing brush B. It's the next entry. It's the next entry. <laughs> we reconstruct brut, and here what you see is the is the reduced uh, syllabic reduced IND syllable that corresponds to that. Okay? So here you get a glimpse of the variety of uh, of uh, treatment that uh, an IND syllable could receive in various dialects. In, uh, in the first century CE. Should we mention Fude? Oh yes, Fude, yes, you know, the, the Japanese, uh, yes, Japanologists here. Uh, that seems to be the origin of Japanese Fude. 
There is also an alternative etymology of Japanese ones. You can decide. Well, let's just say that, that if, uh, if Fude is related, it's plausible that this would be the form that it would be related to because the R has dropped. And that is also in the Northeast, which is at least geographically closer to where Japan is. Isn't it too early for Japanese? Well, it's a dialect, well, you know, it's a dialect form that could have, uh, that could have been insane long enough for, for Japanese to... to in any out. case, that does seem not like the origin of the Sino-Korean food. I mean, word for this. And Sino-Korean is what? Food. Well, in Vietnamese, actually, it's... Uh, food. What? Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, looks not like very close to point. Beijing, but uh, in any case, yeah. Mm. These are probably early loans uh, from Chinese. Uh. All right, so that was uh, root structure. Okay, so are there any more questions about root structure before we move on to, uh, to affixation patterns? I'm going to give you, in a moment, I'm going to give you the list of uh, the old Chinese affixes that we've identified their functions and some examples. And I'm going to tell you about your families. So, should we move on to, to that thing? Yes? Should we break for five minutes before we do that? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have a break coming. Hmm? Five to three. Five to three. A break coming at what? Fifteen thirty. In one hour. In one hour. Uh, I'm fine. Are you fine? Ok, alors. Donc, nous passons à la fixation. Donc, le. Oh, oui, pardon. Yes, of course, I'm sorry. Uh, so. Um, as you all know, there is a li very little morphology in uh, modern standard Chinese. There is some, but not a lot. It's all suffixing, and all the affixes, the, the suffixes that you have in, uh, in modern standard Chinese are uh, recent in origin, and they're uh, sort of transparent. You, you, you get zi, tou, guo, le, zhe. Okay, and that's basically, that's, that's basically all you have in terms of affixation. And these affixes, these modern affixes, originate in, in the past 1,500 years. Okay, most of the, I mean, mostly in the past, uh, between 500 and 1,000, they, they, that's, that's when they appear. But before that, in, in, in Old Chinese, there was, there was a lot of affixation. And it's an old affixation that has been completely, that has completely died out in modern Chinese. Although you can, you can see some vestiges of uh, that morphology in peripheral dialects. For, for instance, in the Qin dialect, in Shanxi, you do find vestiges of, uh, of these affixation processes. And a little bit in the south, too. Uh, but that old Chinese morphology was uh, also the East Asian type. It's the kind of morphology that you find in languages like in, in conservative tibetan burman languages like uh, Tiarong or, uh, or, or Tibetan uh, and in Austroasiatic languages and in the Austronesian languages. In what way is it of that type? Well, it's mostly derivational. That is, it's not like you use it, you use affixation to uh, pr create uh, conjugations or uh, um, declensions as in, as in Latin, although you do have uh, conjugations, uh, some kind of conjugation in, uh, in, in tibetan burman languages due to the integration of, of um, personal pronouns, but that seems to be a secondary development. So it's mostly derivational morphology. That is morphology that, what, what's derivational morphology? It's morphology that, you, that serves to create new words. Okay. Uh, 
not morphology that serves to create things like declensions and conjugations. Uh, it's predominantly prefixing. Most of the, the ver there's, there are several prefixes, uh, but only one infix and basically one suffix, although you could argue that there are more, but there's, there's really one big suffix and, and that's, if there are other suffixes, they're very, very marginal. And that's pretty much like the old Thibodeau-Berman morphology that is predominantly prefixing, few suffixes, and whether or not there was an infix is debatable. It's also like Austroasiatic morphology, predominantly prefixing, if not exclusively prefixing, with one infix. And it's like Austronesian morphology, predominantly prefixing, one infix, some suff a few suffixes, and all derivational. Now, uh, let me tell you where the affixes attach to the root, how they attach to the root. Well, the prefixes occupy the C0 slot, and they behave phonologically like normal, like normal root pre-initials. For instance, this is an example, sl, where the root is l, the prefix is s, and it means to regulate, govern. Uh, it is probably the case that if that you can add a prefix to an IMB syllable without uh, causing the presyllable to fall. Uh, but we do not have any, uh, any secure examples. So I don't want to imply that it's not possible. The infix, which is always R, occupies the C2 slot. But I don't want to claim that all medial R's are infixes. Okay, this is an example of medial R, which is an infix. We think that it is an infix because there is a root KKEP, which means to, to pinch. All right? So the R here, one of the functions of R, especially in nouns, specific, specifically in nouns, is to mark nouns that have a double or multiple structure, as in chopsticks or shoes, or double body parts, uh, things like that. And suffixes, primarily s, are placed at the rightmost, pos rightmost position in a word, after the coda and post-coda if there is one. Okay, so here we have Huang Di de Ti, the first example, Huang Di de Ti, emperor, sovereign, god, consists of root tek, which is a, a verb, meaning to govern, to rule, plus an s suffix, which turns it into a noun, and so we get sovereign emperor god. So as you see, the s attaches after the coda, and in the following example, it's a word meaning chen, uh, to, hate, to, to hate, displeased, or quarrelsome, where the S suffix attaches after the global stop and after the coda. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes. Well, it's just a general wondering because since you posit that I use both minor syllables and prefixes, it is just, it seems to be very complicated how they interact because you said that it's possible that prefix can be added to the ambisyllabic word, but for instance, if prefixes have meanings, so it should be possible to add a prefix to a word which is ambisyllabic. But how exactly would it work? How exactly it would be added? And well, the prefix would, I mean, this is hypothetical, of course, because the, 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 the problem with, with uh, pre-syllables is that they fall, right? Yeah. So if, if they had a prefix attached to them, prefix would fall too. So mm -hmm. the, the Initial consonants of uh, IMB syllables are a little difficult to reconstruct, and especially if they have a prefix attached to them, then you wouldn't see much. Uh, I suspect there are a few cases where we have to do it, but 
I think unfortunately we are here in a in an area that's a little it's it's like a, a dark corner, you know. It's but in theory, it's possible. It's yeah. just for well, the moment, it would it's not be possible. For instance, it, it might be that the uh, uh, well, you could either have a uh, uh, say s followed by the minor syllable, or you could have s schwa followed by the fused form. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to get a third syllable, but I mean, this is just guessing, really, because it's. Uh, just don't have enough information about that. Uh, I think probably we will be able, I mean, the, the kind of case where uh, we will be able to say, uh, we will be able to find evidence for prefixes attached to, uh, uh, pre to, to minor syllables is in the case of reduced minor, minor syllables mm -hmm. in which the consonant is kept mm -hmm. and so a prefix might be, uh, a prefix might be kept too. Uh, but uh, it's, but a, it's it a little too soon to answer you. It, it would also be a, a possibility that if something is attached to the minor syllable, it makes it heavier in this respect, so this should be something which maybe stays. I don't know, there. if it's heavy, it might fall more heavily. <laughs> <or something>. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> okay. All right. There can be sequences of prefixes. Uh, for instance, this is a ver there's a root luck meaning to eat. Sorry, and uh, this root can uh, occur with the m prefix, volitional prefix. So, in which case it gives uh, the verb meaning to eat. But then this luck can have a an s prefix and an s suffix. And uh, one of the functions of the S uh, prefix is to produce something like a, like a causative, not exactly a causative, but something like a causative, and this is what you see, what you see here. So here we have two prefixes. Okay. All right, so as mentioned before, Why isn't that? I'm trying to. Yep. So we. Okay. So uh, remember the difference between hyphens and dots. A, hyphen, a hyphen separates a root from a prefix, and from a suffix. A dot. If we write a dot, that means it's prob. We don't think it's a suffix, although a prefix, although it could be one. And for the present, we do not mark infixed R in any way. Okay, maybe we will have to do it in future, but it poses some... Uh, we don't want to have too cumbersome uh, reconstruction, so for the moment, we just, we just don't mark it. Can I ask one question? Yeah. That R, it does not always stand for that double meaning. No, 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 it's no. No, no I don't, it can be... We think that it can be part of the root. Yeah. We, uh, we think there are roots with an R. OK, okay so I'm going to uh, review the prefixes. And the first, I'm going to first review the prefixes, then the infix, then the suffix. And uh, the aim is to tell you about their functions. Okay. And I'll begin with a set of uh, prefixes which are all nasals. So, first nasal prefix we write as capital N. You've seen it in a moment. A moment uh, you've seen it this morning. We've talked about it this morning. And what N capital N does is that it turns a transitive verb into an intransitive one. As in, for instance, we have this verb krep to press between, in which we think the R was, a, was an infix. But the, uh, the verb also exists in, it's a transitive verb, right? But if you add a, an N in front of it, you get nkrep, which, reg with, and then the N voices the initial, it goes to G, so to grep, and grep evolves to Middle Chinese, grep, narrow, okay? 
and it just happens that in this case, the miao we have a the, the word this word was borrowed by miao yao, in the meaning narrow, and miao yao has a ngat or something like that with, with nasalization, pre-nasalization. So, that's very good. So that was n, uh, many examples of the, of this in Middle Chinese about you know good minimal pairs, very good, uh, and very often written with the same character, which means that the morphol the fact that it was written with the same character means that the morphology was alive at the time that the Kaishu script was created. That's around Han times, about 2,000 years ago. They, used, they didn't think that this N, that this capital N, was something to worry about in the script. No, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. They're not. They. Uh, they're probably not. They, they did not disappear at the same time. Yeah. This was one of the last one to remain. Yeah. Uh, although M, also, the, the, the the other nasal prefix also remained uh, alive uh, until a late date. Uh, so, but so other prefixes may have. Sorry. Sorry. A late date would be around Han times. Yes, a late date would be around Han times, yes. Uh, we're not exactly sure. I mean, uh, we're not exactly sure when S disappeared as a, as a productive prefix. And some affixes may not. We'll talk about two affixes, prefixes T and K, which we don't, we don't really know. It's possible that T was not really product, productive in old in all Chinese times. So this, uh, but certainly this one was productive and, uh, and, and fairly late. Yes. Let me just uh, say, it, I think it's in the preface to the Jingdian Shu, and uh, Lu De Min uh, explicitly mentions uh, two forms which he gives Fanxia spellings. It's a uh, Bai to defeat. Uh, he gives a Fanxia spelling implying P A E J capital H. And another with a B instead, and he says, "Bai ta wei bai" with a P. So to defeat another is uh, to defeat with another a is with a P. And then uh, I don't remember how he states it the other way, but to to suffer defeat is with a B. So at least it was he was aware of this tradition, whether it was just part of the reading tradition or something. Uh, by that time, of what? Yeah. I doubt it. We don't really think it was productive at that time, but he did see this pattern. That's about 560. Yeah, right. 580. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now the next one is a prefix which I call, well, it's M prefix. And M prefix has several, several functions. While capital N only has one function, uh, M has several, which I call M1234. And M1 is further subdivided into ABC. So, OK, M1A changes a non-volitional verb into a volitional one, or maybe a verb of, uh, into a verb of controlled action. The subject controls the action, or he, he wants the action to take place. For instance, uh, means to awake, apprehend, get in sight, and that's a, a non-volitional verb. Okay. Long vowels to be a U. Oh, sorry. Right. Those uh, U instead of a U. Sorry. Uh, so, to awake, apprehend, get in sight, non-volitional, and it has a. Um, Volitional counterpart, which means to learn, to study, to apply oneself to, to apply oneself to apprehend and get an insight. Okay, do the same thing, but wanting 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 it to work. And note the same phonetic. Uh, the, the top part here is phonetic, in. so that's kruk, not krauk. Sorry. Uh, now this prefix 
that's a, uh, came to be viewed as deriving volitional verbs, not necessarily from non-volitional ones, but also from nouns. Okay, if you take a noun, add prefix m, then you get a volitional verb, which means to do the do the action that has to do with with the noun. For instance, a tang, a storeroom, a granary, versus mtang, which gives you zang to hide, to store, and a storeroom, so I don't know why it still has that, that, that meaning. Okay. M, another uh, use of the M prefix is that it changes a verb into an agentive or instrumental noun, that is a noun which is the agent or instrument of the action. And here, for instance, you have that word tro, to prop up, to support. And metro <coughs> is a pillar, a stay. Metro, pillar, stay. And that word is borrowed as, uh, as prenasalized into some Taikadai languages. Okay, so these are examples of the, there are these nasal prefixes, but the na these all have to do with verb verbal morphology. There are other nasal prefixes which are basically nominal morphology, and they are, they seem to be from reduced head nouns. They're not, they're not inherited affixes. These guys, these three, these four guys that I've told you about, they more or less all have equivalents in tibeto burman languages, and they're all in the same functions. Uh, those ones also have equivalents, but they're a different kind of prefix. They're lexical, lexical prefixes. M2 occurs in names of human body parts. For instance, we have tu, meaning a belly of belly or tripe of fish, or belly of pig against tu, belly, human belly, and that has, the initial has been voiced by a nasal prefix, and it's that M, we believe. So tibeto burman languages also have an M prefix in names, in, I mean, some tibeto burman languages have M, an M prefix in names of human body parts, and that M is said to come from the from an old word for, for man, which is me, me in Tibetan. So that would be a reduced form of, an, of a noun meaning man, okay? Uh, which seems to tell us something about word order, incidentally. Another reduced noun is M3, which we have in names of animals, and that we find, o we also find in some tibeto burman languages, like, uh, for instance, in Lolo-ish. Uh, an example is the fawn, uh, which has two readings, one which is nge, we have both nge and me, written in the same way, with a phonetic implying eng, so this one has got to have, has got to be from mnge, mnge, okay? Quite a few examples of this M in animal names. And then there's a fourth uh, M prefix, which seems to occur in nouns having to do with grain. And we suspect it's a reduced form of me grain. Okay, so for instance we have melit for grain, shi, melut, gl glutinous millet, mrak, wheat. The name of wheat is probably a loan word, but then the, uh, this M here 
may have been part of the of the foreign form that was borrowed, but it seems to have been. I mean, it it may have been reinterpreted as an M, as as a as the as the M four prefix. Okay. Now that is not found in other tibeto burman languages as, in, in tibeto burman languages, as far as I know. Any questions on these nasal prefixes? Yep. Just coming back to what Barbara was saying, that it seems to be an extremely saturated system with seven different things which can be marked by the same form. Mm -hmm. So the, in terms of polysemy, it's, it's tremendously complex. So you either presume that it's coming from different periods of time, or maybe there is something else involved there, because it, it seems to be an extreme, in terms of complexity, system with, with a great load on one element. Or well, we have seven different prefixes M. Well, we don't think M2, M3, M4 were productive. Kay. OK, so fr for, from the point of view of the speaker, of the learner, there was this thing was just as a it was just as a as part of the root, uh, or yeah, Bill. I was going to say though that, that actually it seems to me there's a tendency for uh, languages to uh, reuse their morphemic material uh, for more than one function anyway. So Absolutely. in S, uh, you know, in, in English, uh, S is for plurals, it's for possessives, it's a reduced form of is. Uh, think of all the e of the N suffixes in Germanic languages, can be plural, it's a verb infinitive, and so forth. But you never find seven functions. So well, no, mm. I, I don't know if we will or not, but, uh, mm. but as I say, uh, as Laurent says, uh, we're, at this point, basically, we're looking for patterns yeah. that might explain why the words are the way they are. Well, you see, the, the and uh, this one is the one that's really only these three are productive yeah. or may may have been productive, and uh, M1A and M1B may have been con may be considered the same prefix because they will both derive a volitional verb. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're so in they're in complementary distribution, mm -hmm. so it's really one and two. Okay, as the other ones, they're uh, just inherited things that are more or less... It's just because you said that they were all durational, so for this... Um, well, I, I mean they're not, they're not inflectional, in, that, in the sense of not being inflectional. But they are different kinds of, of derivational prefixes. The, 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 the first ones are really in... These guys are were really productive while these ones are really inherited lexical prefixes. It's it's different, a, a different kind of uh, animal. Well, like yeah. uh, in English, also we have a th uh, suffix uh, mm -hmm. that makes a noun out of an adjective like mm -hmm. width, breadth, depth, mm -hmm. and so forth. It's a pattern, mm -hmm. but uh, it's probably not uh, synchronically a, a suffix. Okay. Other questions? Should we move on? Okay. Now let's look at non-nasal prefixes. And how much time do I have? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes, right? Okay. So there was an S, which I call applicative, because uh, the an applicative prefix is a prefix that allows a verb to increase its valency. That is, it allows a verb to take as to take as its object a participant which would not be normally treated as an object, um, a peripheral participant, like a, benef a beneficiary or an instrument, or something like that. So what, this is what happens with S, uh, the S prefix. Um, here's an example. So I mentioned a moment ago that there was a, a, a mluck verb, meaning to eat without an S. Now the form with S means to feed. And in one way, in what way is that an applicative? Well, the, no, the verb without S is the object of, the, of to eat is the thing that you eat. Okay, it's the, th the thing eaten.
But the object of, of, of this one, s, is not the thing that you eat. The object is the person for who, to, to whom you are giving it. Okay? And the food, the kind of food that you're giving the person, if it is mentioned at all, is going to be demoted to a peripheral role in the sentence. It's going to be some kind of, uh, of uh, instrument or uh, some kind of uh, means complement. So you feed someone by means of such and such a food. Okay. Now this prefix is very common. Yep. Question. Um, but is there a rule or can you, can you say something by, for example, this applicative uh, prefix applies to some words but does not to others because of course there are words which can change their balance without any change I don't I don't think in general you expect every case of uh, causative or something like no, this. No, it's not yeah. challenging, but sometimes there, there are certain, I don't know, maybe semantic rules or phonetic rules, which just... Uh, well, I guess we just don't know, but I mean... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's one thing here. Uh, there's, first of all, the S prefix could only occur before certain consonants. Yeah. You did not have it... You could not have it before. You, in, in most cases, you, you don't see, you can't see an S if the if the C one is a labial or a velar. Yeah. You don't see it. You know there may have been examples, but you don't. We have there's only one one or two examples preceding M, and uh, but very basically nothing before other labials, uh, and also before Eng you get SNG, but SK apparently. S fall, so you don't see it. Uh, as to uh, why it happens before, why some verbs with, uh, let's say, alveolar initials have it and others do not, well, uh, we just see the end result. Uh, yeah. I think another thing, too, is that uh, uh, we're relying on this reading tradition uh, which dates from the 6th century. <laughs> And uh, so uh, you know how, mu how much we can see, if you look at the Guangyun, how many multiple pronunciations have been lost either through sound change or just analogy uh, uh, leveling uh, between then and now. Yes. And uh, similarly, a similar process m probably was going on. So there may have, I mean, I'm not, of course, you can't say that because we don't see them, therefore they must have been there, but, but uh, it, we mustn't expect that we have found all of the morphology that was alive in old Chinese times. We're looking at traces of it. In okay, another, uh, another S prefix, which we call S2, derived nouns out of verbs and nouns, of, nouns that are circumstances of, of, of an action, such as nouns of place, where an action takes place, or time, where, when an action takes place. An example is the verb for to shoot, which already has the volitional M prefix, mlak. And we have a, um, we have uh, an S prefix, S prefix form of, the form of that word, which is xie, some lax, archery hall, place where you uh, shoot with bow, okay? Huh? Voila. Voila. Uh, other example is not uh, not a noun of time, but a noun of instrument. So, because the S prefix could also derive uh, names of instruments out of verbs. So you have this verb ye to drag or trail uh, versus xie rope fetters. So here we have a, a root lat, uh, 
preceded with the S prefix, so slat means the instrument which you use to drag or trail. Uh, okay. Now T, uh, next prefix is T, and T is a prefix of uh, uncertain productivity. It was pro probably not productive in Old Chinese already. But you do find it in, uh, it seems to occur with some, uh, not exactly frequency, but there seems to be a cluster of, uh, of examples of T uh, in certain intransitive verbs, like, like the krum, to walk hesitantly, where the exist existence of a uvular root is indicated by the phonetic here. And you get also T in certain nouns of uh, inalienably possessed nouns, such as n color terms like the kren, red. I think Marisov reconstructs something like kren, red in Tibetan Burman. But we need a T to obtain the Middle Chinese form. Although the character very clearly indicates a velar in the root. Okay. And this is the Kong uh, husband's father, where clearly you have this Kong form here. Or oh, shouldn't it be a uvula? Should be a uvula. Should be a uvula. Should be a Q here, sorry. Uh, husband's father. And that form is still found in modern dialects, uh, especially in Min, with a ta prefix, ta guan in Min. And it's also found in what, in the dialect that is called uh, Xiang Nan Tu Hua, the, uh, no, sorry, 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 Yue Pei Tu, Yue Pei Tu Hua, in the northern, uh, northern Guangdong Patois you get a, a T prefix in that word, taguang or something. Tagong, taguang, I forget what. Okay. And finally, we have a K prefix in verbs, whose function is still unclear. It may be some kind of imperfective. And this is an example. There is a root riu, which means to twist. And you have it in uh, an adjective meaning down curving. Uh, it's, it's, it's in a line of the Shijing Nan Yo Tio Mu. To the south, there is a tree with down curving branches. And we believe this, r this form, Tiu, contains the same root as this word, Miu, uh, to lie which is to twist the truth. And notice the, that means it's, it's to twist the truth intentionally, okay? So we think that K over there is a prefix, of some kind of verbal prefix. Now, uh, we formally uh, reconstructed a lot of uh, K prefixes uh, in nouns. And one reason for reconstructing a K prefix was in cases, in the rather numerous cases where you had word family connections between a word beginning in K and a word beginning in Y, in Y, in Middle Chinese Y. At the time, the only origin we had for a Y, for a Middle Chinese Y, the Yu Si initial, was L. So we thought that if you have a word family connection between a word beginning in K and another beginning in L, it must be because the root was L and there was a K prefix. So that's what we did in, a, in our paper of 1998, and that's what I did in my book of 1999. But since then, uh, we have found another origin for Middle Chinese Yod, 
Middle Chinese uh, Y, as you will see. It's a uvular origin. And the same uvulars can also give you a K. Okay, so now our interpretation of these examples is not K, is not L versus KL, but two kinds of uvulars, Q and capital G. All right, so this has led us to abandon most of our examples for K prefix in nouns, but K prefix still remains in verbs. And indeed, you still find the K prefix active in some Chinese dialects in Shanxi, in the Qin dialects, in meanings that have to do with the imperfective. Yes? I have one small question, because what you show us, the prefixes, it's exactly the same thing what you can get as a consonant in a minor syllable. Exactly the same things. And since you have cases where uh, the consonant of the minor syllable merges with root, like fruit that you were showing is right in brush, how can you tell the two apart and say that this is not a fused form from a yambi syllabic word in a certain dialect which evolved further like that? How do you have any grounds to keep these cases apart? Well, first, it's not exactly the same thing. I mean, it's not exactly the same list. There are uh, there are pre -seal, there are, for instance, eng. You, you have an eng prefix yeah. in at least one form, the, form the, 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 the state of lu, which includes the name, the word for fish. So we think this is mra. Okay? We, think the, we think it could be written with the phonetic for fish because there, there was a presyllable, there was an eng, pre, a ng presyllable. It was ngra. Mm -hmm. Fish is, is nga or possibly ngra. And uh, so we think that the, the, the fish phonetic could be used to write a ngra, okay? But then the ng fell, and what you left it in Middle Chinese is lu. Yeah. So we have absolutely no reason to think that this is a prefix, yeah. all right? So it's not, exact, it's not exactly the same list. Yeah, but how to exclude the possibility that we have fused, you are dealing here with fused forms yes. of yambi syllabic words? Well, I think, uh, I mean... Well, basically, yeah, it's the I function, it's the... Have, uh, yeah, well but the function is not certain in many cases. That's really well, cer uh, you're certainly right about that. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we, uh, the, the prefixes can also appear with uh, minor syllables as, mm. as well. So, uh, uh, I mean, I guess the problem is worse than you say, because <laughs> whether it's a fused form or an... Uh, it could be a syllable, uh, it could be a prefix or not a prefix in, this, in either case. But we're just trying to find semantic patterns. Yes, I think we're going by semantic patterns. We're, if we have, if we have, I mean, the ideal case is when we have a pair, a word occurring with or with and, with and without yeah. a certain. Uh, a certain, a certain consonant, yeah. and when the difference that the presence and absence of the consonant makes in the meaning of the, f of the two forms is one that we know <coughs> well to be associated with a certain morphological process, then we say that it's, that it's a prefix. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right, uh, you know, I mean, there's a difference of, uh, difference in the uh, confidence that we have mm -hmm. in those prefixes. For instance, we are very confident that the S in S is a prefix, but our confidence in the prefixness of the T in Tikram is less. Uh, okay, so we may be wrong, in fact, in, in, in some of these, but th th these are, this is, these are hy our hypotheses for, for, for the moment. To point out, we, I mean, in many cases, uh, He's only given you one example, but uh, we don't base uh, these prefixes on a single example. Okay. Yeah, I'm giving one example per, per prefix. Okay. Any questions? All right. Yes, uh, Sven? It's in the second row, where we have S2. Um, if we look at these examples, 
the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right is not simply in the prefix s, but there's also always a difference uh, in well the absence or presence of the suffix s. So how can you or we uh, be sure that the difference in meaning so is not due to the suffix? Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the S suffix is also could give, num a could, could give you a noun. Yes, uh, I think. Uh, well, I think we have it without the initial S also. Yeah. So the the answer is that is that you have to look at the entire, the entire word family, which is usually more than more than two forms, and then to figure out what the what the overall. Uh, what the overall pattern is. Okay, so we I think we have uh, I think we have a mlax we have a sh we have a mlax form, which means to shoot. Or we do, don't we? I think we do. Yes, we have a mlax form that means to shoot. So in this case, it's the s that does the difference. So what's the difference between mlax and mlax? We don't know the the meaning of the s suffix is not uh, is not uh, is not always clear. Uh, the s suffix is uh, ubiquitous. We assume that all cases all, that all we and actually most students of old Chinese assume that all the tuition all the all the words that are tuition in Middle Chinese come from s come from I mean, once had the s suffix. But the functions of that s suffix are uh, are many and often very difficult to very difficult to detect, especially to detect from glosses that have more or less been moreover been translated into English or so. Uh, in, in most cases, it's uh, well, it's just we just don't know what it does. This suffix, yeah. I mean, we can identify some of its functions, but not not all. And I'm going to tell you about some in a moment. Okay, so <coughs> like other presyllables, prefixes have iambic variants. Uh, this is zhao, early, and it's got a voiceless initial in Middle Chinese. However, it's got a it's got a prenasalized initial in Miao Yao, as you remember from this morning. Okay, and it's got a. It also has a, um, a softened initial in Min. So the softened initial in Min, together with the prenasalized Miao Yao in uh, prenasalized Miao Yao uh, form, indicate that there was that there was a lost uh, nasal nasal prefix, and moreover that the prefix must be iambic. Okay, so it must be either capital N with schwa or M with schwa, mm. but usually the, pref the, the nasal prefix that goes with intransitive verbs is capital N, so we, we, we believe this was capital N. All right? We don't really see why there would be an M here. A capital N makes very good sense, but an M doesn't make any sense. So this is intransitive N, and it's iambic. Yeah, it's. Another example is this verb, mpa, to patch up, which is pu in modern Chinese. And we reconstruct an iambic prefix, which consists of m1a, that's the volitional prefix, with a schwa. Why do we reconstruct a schwa? Well, it's because we have a mean softened initial, a miao yao prenasalized initial, and there is moreover textual evidence in this case. Bill, you want to you want to <coughs> explain it? Yeah, um, there are, you know, if some of the uh, literature, the philological literature in Chinese, for example, by uh, Wang Wang Yansun, Wang uh, Yinzhi. Uh, lists a bunch of forms which can ha uh, sort of function words which uh, 
can have different meanings. So there is a variant according to, uh, according, I believe it's Wang Yin Zhu, I'd have to check my yeah, paper, yeah, yeah. Uh, says that uh, Yun, the one that's just, uh, you know, they said, uh, is a variant, uh, can mean Yo. Okay. Well, it looks pretty good. That is, they both start the same way, for us they both begin with a capital G W schwa. Uh, yo has a glottal stop after it, and yun has an N after it. Uh, well, I, it turns out that two of the examples, and they're not that many examples of this, but two of the examples cited in, uh, uh, in support of this uh, interpretation uh, in two examples, the yun occurs before this very word. Okay. Uh, so I think it's uh, possible that the nasal on the following word has been attached to the preceding word. Now this M here, well, you, it, you wouldn't be able to put an M there uh, phonotactically, probably. Uh, but I think it, we have a number of cases like that where uh, we have things which seem to be resegmented where the uh, a nasal on the fault at the beginning of the following word gets in, attached instead to the end of a preceding word. And uh, there's several other cases like that. <coughs> it also occurs before uh, lie to come, which uh, we have reason to believe might have had an M because of my. Right? And uh, I don't know, there's a couple of other such cases. So there are at least Anyway, that's a possible interpretation of those uh, things. Otherwise, we don't know why uh, yun would be used to write yo. But can I ask, please, yep. once again, to repeat how you distinguish between the ambisyllabic words and prefixed words, since they both behave in the same way and start with similar inventories of consonants. That's, by the way, how they develop. No, no, we don't. We, we don't actually. The, the the evidence for distinguishing it is not in the way they develop; it is in the way they pattern with other words in, in word families. Okay, if we, if it's by the, the the semantics, the semantic changes they introduce in the words that they. Okay. Oh, you mean here, for instance, how do we know that the mer here is a prefix and that it's not, and that it's not a, um, yeah. Well, it's just because this is a volitional verb, so it makes sense to suppose that it's a volitional verb. Mm -hmm. I suppose... It's also used as a noun, so in some cases it could be this instrumental in also, so... Well, but you're right, we cannot exclude that it's, it's just a, it's just a... But do you have yambi syllabic words in, in word families? Is it something that you can attest in word family? Or you have sure, only yeah. the choice of a monosyllabic root? Uh, yeah, I'm sure we have yambi syllabic words in... Uh, you mean uh, yambi syllabic roots? Yambi uh, syllabic yes, roots in, in word, word families? families yeah. uh, of course there are a few of them. Uh, well, as, as Laurent pointed out, it's hard to identify because uh, they tend to get worn down anyway. It's, a, it's yeah. exceptional when we find both syllables preserved. Uh, I, I think you should just realize that, you know, this is really difficult it's stuff, you know. I, I mean, I know, you, I know it's not a, yeah. really a criticism, but uh, we have to work on the basis of hypotheses. Uh, we're trying to figure out what could explain the things that we find in Min dialects, primarily min dialects and in loanwords in other languages and pre-nasalized things mm -hmm. like that. And so <coughs> we have to look at the examples and try to put them into classes and you're, it's perfectly possible that, that mm -hmm. uh, we haven't, we can't in every case distinguish mm -hmm. between a, uh, an iambic select, iambi syllabic root mm -hmm. and a monosyllabic root with a prefix. It's just Okay, but, but let me give you an example to, <coughs> to support the idea that there were, IM, that there were iambic prefixes. Uh, in this case, you're right, we cannot exclude that it was, a, uh, that it was a, not a prefix, a pre-syllable. There is one case, it's, uh, there is a, it's a passage in, I forget where it is, it's in the Shangshu, I think, uh, 
there is one, uh, someone says, I think the, the, someone says to the servants of the king, it says, Oh, you servants of the king, Wu nian er zu. Wu is not, it's the negation on, on the surface. Nian is remember, er zu is your ancestors. So on the surface it means, do not remember your, do not remember your ancestors. But the commentary says, it doesn't mean do not remember, it means remember yeah. your ancestors. <laughs> okay, so what, this is a clear example of the M, of the M prefix, the volitional prefix. Because you see, remember is non-volitional. But here it's an order, it's an imperative. And you cannot give an order you cannot use, an, use a non-volitional verb to give an order. The verb has to be volitional in order to be, to be put in an imperative. So here, they put the mer volitional prefix in its iambic form before, before nian. And it's because, there's, because the best way of writing a ma, uh, it could have been a ma, by the way. I mean, we write a schwa, but it could have been, it, it could have been a, a lower vowel. The... Uh, they, they, they wrote it as Wu, which is the normal Old Chinese, which is the normal character for, for syllable Ma. Okay, so this is a good example of the, a clear example of a, an iambic variant of the M volitional prefix. Yeah, well, that's what, that's that's the point. That's the that's that's the point exactly. They put it in the imperative because they make it volitional. It, it's yeah. it's a different meaning. It's it's you know you make an effort to remember. And it tells you yeah, make an effort to do something uh, if over which they have no control. Uh, so there are two kinds of remembering. There's remembering where you do it deliberately, and remembering where you do it sort of without control. But only the first is appropriate in an imperative. So in a don't forget, you would uh, expect a don't do forget. Don't what? Don't do forget. Mm. You would need that because to forget is also a moment. Where it is. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. So let's. Uh, Let's move on to the infix, and the infix was R, and we distinguish uh, three uses of that R infix, which are all, all have to do with uh, either plurationality or multiplicity of places or multiplicity of agents or multiplicity of times. Uh, so um, Stan Starosta used the term distributed for to cover all these all these uh, uses of the of the infix. So in verbs of action, it's distributed action. That means it's either an action done several times or in several places, or on several patients or with several uh, uh, agents or by several agents. Uh, one instance of this is the verb tang to support, which, out of which you can derive a noun meaning a doorposts, uh, using uh, the. Um, well, this is. I'm sorry. This is a bad example. This is a no nominal example. Uh, there are two doorposts, and uh, well, sorry. Well, anyway, what I, I think the R here uh, is put into that uh, verb because there are two doorposts. Okay, well, and the, probably the M is an instrument of action. In steady verbs, it confers an intensive meaning to the, to the steady verb. For instance, truck, straight. And in nouns, we believe it's distributed structure. In fact, this doorpost example was a, an example of R3. I'm sorry. And another example is 
tweezers, chopsticks with the R multiple object, which I uh, gave you a moment ago. I'm sorry, uh, I, so I haven't given examples of R1. R1, I can, I don't have one that comes to mind right away, so um, perhaps I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Any questions on this? So let's move on to the S suffix. So S suffix did a lot of things, and we only understand a few of these things. One of them is nominalization of verbs. For instance, muto means to plant, like to plant trees. And shu is the old Chinese names for planted trees, uh, while mu is the, the name of natural trees, at least I think. It should be that way. Uh, so mtos tree is an S derived form of mto to plant. There is a perfective uh, function of the S suffix. By the way, this is found in Tibeto Burman languages. The first one is found in Tibeto Burman languages. The second one, perfective, is also found. Uh, okay, for instance, you have a, a verb can. Can to watch, it's imperfective. You watch a gate, you watch for something to happen, but the thing hasn't happened yet. And can you see? And in order to see it, it must have happened. Okay. And yet another function of S is uh, what I call uh, outwardly directed action. Perhaps better, f better labels are available. Uh, an example is do, receive, versus dus, transmit. And there are other, a lot of well-known examples, for instance, my to buy, and my to sell. Okay. And a lot of residue, a lot of examples of the S suffix, that is of Tushan words, which do not fall into any of these uh, three categories. Okay. All right, very quickly now, because we don't have a lot of time and we want to keep some time for discussion, notion of word families. What's a word family? Well, in our approach, a word family is, the, is defined very uh, strictly as a set of words that have the same root and different affixes. They have to have exactly the same root. Okay. Example, root tak to place. Uh, first verb is, uh, sh first form is shu to place. We think it has root tak, volitional m1a, s2 or s4 suffix. Another one is drak to put, apply, to publish, and we think R is there because you put, apply, publish a series of things, like words in a text. Then metrak is to attach, and that's, that's volitional, that's do it volitionally. That is presumably also volitional, so I don't know why it does not have the prefix, but okay, that's our hypothesis for the moment. At least the affixes we suppose fit the meanings. Their absence is not predictable. And finally, a noun derived out of, uh, out of track, out of this one. We think that this, this, this noun, place, order, position, which has an S suffix, S, is S1 derived out of this one. Okay. So that's a word family. Other example, root kep, to grasp. Uh, this is a noun which we think is derived from, root, from the root through zero derivation. Sword handle, the part of the root of the sword that you grasp. Uh, a form with S prefix, to grasp, to hold. But this is a little, it's, it's, it's bizarre in some ways because normally S does not 
is not seen preceding Vidar, so this, this example is, uh, is problematic. Also, the applicative meaning does not occur strongly here. So maybe this is, this is not, uh, maybe this is a problem. Maybe this, we may change that in, the fu in future. That's a volitional verb with M, M1A. And that's a noun with infixed R. And finally, that's a stative verb with prefix capital N and R intensive. Other word family, we have, we suppose there is a root pan, pan, to separate, to divide. This is a noun derived from the root by means of the S suffix. So this one has a nasal prefix that voiced the root, and we are not sure whether it was capital N or M, because the sum of the meanings are compatible with intransitive, others with volitional. It's possible that the two were there, and they were written by the same character. Uh, this one has the M prefix. Uh, the, the, the M actor noun or instrumental noun prefix M and we don't know why it has the, N su the S suffix and this one means to distribute with a nice distributed meaning <laughs> and this is why we believe it has, distribu it has the, the R infix so there is the root luck so we've seen that, maluk, volitional. Mm. Here, interesting, this is the word which means to eat up gradually in an eclipse. That is, the, the, moon, uh, eats, so this, the moon eats up the sun or something like that. And uh, it, it does have an imperfective meaning. Okay? So this gives us a clue as to why s has, uh, an, s, has an s2. The S2 could be perfective here. It could be the it could be perfective meaning. And this is another use of uh, S that's food, and here we think the final S is nominalizing. What you give, what you feed people with. Okay, so these are word families, and uh, needless to say. Most of the words in most of the words in Chinese belong to word families which have not been delineated yet. So this is work that lies ahead and that we want to do. Identify the word families, figure out the, the meaning of the root and the functions of the affixes that are needed to derive their members. Finally, one last thing. Uh, it sometimes happens that we find word families that have almost the same root, but not exactly. Like, for instance, you will have two roots for place, one of which is tak, and the other of which is tak. Tak versus tak, that is difference of aspiration. We cannot relate these two roots by means of the morphology we've identified in Old Chinese. We suppose that is older morphology. Okay, we suppose that Old Chinese already had related roots, roots that were... Uh, that go back to a morphology that's older than Old Chinese. All right? So for instance, aspiration. Also, it's very common for two roots to have, one of them has pingsheng, no glottal stop, and the other has shangsheng, glottal stop. And they mean more or less the same thing. Okay, so that's not, that's not all, we cannot explain that in terms of, yeah. We cannot explain that by means of old Chinese morphology. Type A and B is another thing. So in those cases, we speak of related roots. <coughs> right, I'll finish here. And um, I hope that you will ask questions or make comments. Do you want to make a break? Yeah, because it's already. Yeah. Yeah, maybe.
some coffee. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It's a uh, coffee break before the okay. question the discussion. Y a-t-il des questions ou des... Are there any questions or comments, criticisms? Well, it's, 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 uh, ça dépend du sujet. Hein. Si, un, si le sujet est animé, tu, tu peux, enfin, je sais pas, tu peux avoir grasping par, euh, un, objet. par un objet en métal, je sais pas. Ou... Yeah, well, uh, okay. As you say, it's, a, it's the usual problems <laughs> posed by <laughs> word families. <laughs> okay, I um, mean, yeah. Oh, okay, one one thing we can, we can one thing we can say here that we uh, it's difficult to be uh, well. Here we don't have a we don't have a, a non, non volitional. No, we don't have a grasp Right, but I've said that, uh, but this one has the S prefix. Uh, so I don't know in one way, they, we, we don't really know in what way they interact. Maybe, I, I don't know what an SM would do, what an SM would do preceding, a, whether we would be able to tell. I don't think we should assume that we're able to tell that there is no M in this one. Um, right, but the meaning also is... Well, the raw data for this is the occurrence of these items in uh, classical Chinese texts, uh, and each occurrence uh, is interpreted by commentators, and so forth. Well, sometimes we can tell uh, without uh, help, but we have this Jing Dian Shi Wen, which uh, has a lot of commentary on classical texts. Now, for the first pass, uh, frankly, we've looked pretty much, uh, you know, we've gone by definitions that we find in Carl Green's, uh, book and so forth, but the, the next the, uh, stage should be to be more detailed and, and careful about this so that we would have not just a gloss but an actual example uh, where the Jing Dian Shi Wen says it's, it's used, it's pronounced such and such a way and uh, it means such and such a thing. Um, but, uh, and in fact, uh, well, uh, Pang Yun uh, and uh, his students are, uh, have prepared a digital version of, the, uh, of this source, and we should be able to get it into a database like this so that we can easily find all of the relevant examples. Right now it's very difficult because you just have to look up, you know, there'll be a page full of mm. things and you have to look them all up individually. But, uh, uh, of course, uh, we may turn out to be wrong when these things, or, or Carlgren may turn out to be wrong, or uh, we just don't know. Uh, but there are enough fairly clear cases uh, uh, that uh, uh, we think it's worth, these ideas are worth uh, working on. Can I say what, what, what I understand mm -hmm. you are doing, and you please correct me if I okay. say it wrong. It was my impression is that you are working on word families to isolate the roots, and then you see what is attached to the roots. And right. based on what you can identify for those things attached, you try to isolate new root families. That's how it is. Well, yes. Uh, uh, you know, the way it goes is it, 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 like this. Uh, uh, well, maybe I could give this example of Jie and Ji. Well, I don't, I'm not in the habit of quoting uh, Chomsky, but uh, in the beginning of syntactic structures, he says that if you 
uh, formulate a, a precise uh, solution to a certain problem, uh, then either it turns out not to be right, in which case you can often expose the reason for the difficulty, uh, or sometimes it's right and it also turns out to explain something that you hadn't expected, that you hadn't uh, asked for, so to speak. Uh, let me uh, show you a couple of examples like that, where it's possible indeed to uh, 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 to recognize word families where uh, they had, had not previously been uh, easy to recognize. There's this form here. which uh, means to make contact um, or to like for instance you I mean it's still uh, used in the case of going to the train station to pick somebody up it's sort of like this right mm -hmm. coming together like this and this uh, well I suppose to be cautious we should write it something like that not sure what's going on with the initial it, it could be basically a, a uh, uh, just an affricate root, or it could be um, uh, that it's more complicated. Uh, and there's another form, uh, G, uh, well, uh, the phonetic of this, this phonetic suggests a final P, okay? Uh, this phonetic, on the other hand, suggests a final T. Okay. Uh, however, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and not, not to keep you in suspense. Uh, this is basically the noun formed from this. This word means connection, and this means to, this is the noun, this is the verb. But already uh, at the time this uh, script was being developed, uh, probably what happened here was that the first step was that PS changed to TS. And that happened very early. That happened already in the uh, Shijin. We can tell from, uh, so PS and TS rhyme in the Shijin. Uh, in some cases we have, we know, we have the forms written with the same phonetic. So for example, uh, uh, ne and na. Uh, Ne is inside, and it's uh, something like this. We're not sure what the vowel is. And this, and na, it, I'll, I'll tell you what they mean in a second, is uh, this. Middle Chinese is this and this. Um, so this means inside, and this means to send in. Uh, as in sending in tribute or something like that. Um, so in this case, uh, it's not difficult to make the connection because even though this uh, word ends the same way this one does, and this Y, H often represents T, S, in this case, the same character, or well, at least the same phonetic was used by both long enough that, that uh, and, and the semantic connection is fairly clear. Uh, this, I suspect uh, that the, in the early Chinese writing system used this character for this root, whether there was an S there or not. And in fact, that's probably what was going on here as well. Uh, this uh, uh, ra radical here is added uh, presumably fairly late. That's what, uh, that's what usually happens. And uh, they would simply write this, well, not only for this, but also for the related form, uh, root which is from type B, okay. Um, but the semantics here are excellent. That is, this would, matches the uh, de-verbal de uh, de noun meaning of this ex uh, excellently. And it so happens, actually, that Duan uh, uh, Yu uh, I discovered that Duan Yu had made this connection. Uh, and he said that, uh, I, I don't remember exactly what he, he put, but he recognized that this in some passage was either a lone character, was to be read like this or vice versa. And, uh, but 
it, this is a consequence of our assumptions that, that so this this means we can look for other cases like this where you, you wouldn't necessarily have noticed the phonetic is different uh, you have a labial here, you don't have a labial here, obviously, but it, once we know that this P and J H is a, is a recurrent uh, connection, we can uh, keep looking for it, and there are other examples as well. So, um, in, I mean, in general, uh, when you come up with hypotheses, um, it's only a hypothesis if it makes some predictions which you can test. So when we say that there was an S applicative or something like this, this, is a, this predicts that we should be able to find uh, examples of this, possibly more than we started with. And uh, if indeed we keep finding examples, then we'll keep that hypothesis. If we you know, run, if it runs dry and we can't find more than a couple or three cases, well, actually, there are already more than a couple or three cases, so quite a few cases, but if in any case here we can't seem to make it work or it doesn't uh, seem to produce any useful insights into things that we don't already know, then maybe it's time to uh, reconsider it. That's more or less what happened with the K prefix, which we uh, were using for a while because it was our best guess at the explanation, and now we think we have a better explanation. So the, uh, it may seem paradoxical that our hypotheses can make predictions about the past, but basically it's predictions about what we will find. Uh, similarly, uh, another way of testing these, uh, which I'll be talking about uh, on Wednesday morning, is uh, excavated texts where the script is very different from the current script and you often find words written in ways that confirm your hypotheses about them. For example, uh, I think this is uh, st still right, there's a word kui, which in Middle Chinese is like this and it means to come back, uh, to retreat, uh, to move back uh, and we didn't, I didn't know what this was, and so forth, but in the, uh, I guess this is in the Ma Wang Dui, uh, Lao Tzu, which was discovered in the 70s, I guess, the character is written this way, and this suggests that it's, uh, well, again, we're not sure how this thing worked. But this is a hn, a hn can give a th, and uh, again, this is probably a actually a related root rather than a, than a synchronically connected form, but at least it, it uh, tells us something about the origins of the word. And there are many cases like that. I, I, as I say, I'll, I'll give you some examples on uh, Wednesday morning where uh, our hmm. guesses ha about words based on our hypotheses, have, have been supported by uh, evidence that's just dug up out of the ground in the last 10 or 20 years. Yes. What can be the date of the change of TS to TS? Um, well, I think... Um, uh, I said it's uh, reflected in rhymes in the Shijin, so that depends on the date of the Shijin, okay? Uh, well, most people say maybe, what, 700 B.C. or something is more or less when you can, uh, or 7th century, maybe a little bit later, when it took its final form, but there are poems of different ages in the, in the uh, collection. Uh, we know that there are cases where P.S. and T.S. rhyme in the Shijin. Now, when we see this J.H., we don't always know whether to treat it as P.S. or T.S., so there may be cases in the, the earlier poems in the Shijing where P.S. rhymes only with P.S., but it's difficult to tell unless we've already identified the word, unless we have other means of saying that the, that the word had a P.S. So it's possible that early poems in the Shijing have a P.S. rhyming with P.S., and it had not changed yet. And then uh, uh, it's uh, definitely by, before the... Uh, text was finished, uh, 
the change had occurred. So the earliest things in the Shijing may be as early as the 11th century. Um, now, another way you can tell when these things happen, of course, is by changes in the script. So th nobody would write the character this way if they were still pronouncing it P.S., because this uh, uh, implies a final T. Okay. So uh, if you see that they start, I mean, as soon as this character appears, you can assume that at that time and place, uh, somebody was pronouncing it with a T instead of a P. And that's the, the value of these. I mean, see, we're getting, you know, in China nowadays, there's such a construction boom that, you know, every time they build a Walmart or something, they have to dig a foundation. <laughs> and uh, every time they dig a foundation, they run into some old tomb, and it's it's all over the place. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to stop everything and call the uh, state archaeologists in and uh, let them do whatever they need, and then you go ahead and build your Walmart. But uh, uh, even if that doesn't always work, uh, still there there are uh, texts popping up from a lot of different places and uh, from a lot of different time periods, and so. With careful study, we should be able to be more precise about these things. Let's see. Let's think of another. Oui. Au ça m'étonnerait. Euh, je ne pense pas que le taï est... Je pense pas que le M... Mais il a peut être emprunté à un dialecte chinois qui avait, qui avait toujours le, qui avait le, le N de la même source que le min. Parce que les, les, les emprunts chinois dans les langues taï, les, les plus nombreux, c'est... Mais, le, les premiers, les, mais il doit y en avoir de plus anciens. Enfin, les, premiers, les premiers emprunts ont dû avoir lieu dès le. Dès les Qin, oui, dès le. Dès le royaume de Zhao Tuo, dans la région de Canton, vers, de, vers 200 avant. Gong Chen, qui a traduit Laurent's book et est en train de traduire mine, His doctoral dissertation was on uh, uh, Chinese, uh, well, Chinese vocabulary shared with Thai, because many Chinese scholars believe that, that Thai is part of Sino-Tibetan. But in any case, uh, he uh, made a careful analysis of different strata and things like that. That's what his uh, dissertation is about. I still haven't read through it, frankly, but uh, so there's probably a lot of stuff in there. But, uh, uh, In all of these cases, I mean, in the case of Vietnamese, in the case of Vietnamese, in the case of uh, uh, Korean, uh, and uh, Kham Thai, and things like that, uh, uh, there usually is a, a certain amount of stuff that's that's uh, borrowed at a very early time, which is old enough to be useful for us. I have a small question because you are obviously dealing with extreme, extremely complex matters. Mm -hmm. Let's <laughs> take it for granted. Uh, and also with an enormous time gap that you are reconstructing for, sure. mm -hmm. and also for dialectal diversity that you have in all Chinese. And I know that you are now working also on different dialects and dialectal variation, mm -hmm. and also synchronic changes, like for instance what you were saying, PS, PS changing Yes, and, and all this. Would your final book, the version number one, include also explicit assumptions about further uh, time stages of all Chinese, for instance, or dialectal variation? How? Well, certainly dialectal variation. We have several ideas now mm. about that. Let me give you the, uh, an example of the, of the kind of thing. Uh, Let's 
strange. Oh. It's a yo-yo. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, I mentioned that we have accepted Starston's hypothesis about a about a, a coda R, which is not in my 1992 book, or uh, but uh, and you have to be careful. I think I mentioned this at the, at the in the journée, but. Uh, this is different from what Karlgren reconstructed. Karlgren also reconstructed an R, but it's uh, different. Uh, most we assume that this, and uh, Starostin said that the main development was to N, but uh, there were some cases to uh, J. And uh, this is uh, uh, there are these little comments in uh, in mostly in Han Dynasty commentaries on classical texts. Uh, uh, well, Zheng Qian, for example, was uh, uh, very fond of, I mean, was very, com very commonly made comments about uh, what he said were pronunciation errors, that is, what things were written in a certain way in the text because the person who was writing it uh, had a certain kind of pronunciation. Um, and there are a number of cases like this, if you, and they're tied to a particular place. They'll say the people from so-and-so say so-and-so like so-and-so. And if you, uh, I plotted these on the map. This is uh, actually some time ago. And, and uh, well, I, I don't really know how to draw the Shandong Peninsula, but it's over here somewhere. And you can just draw a, a line like that. All of the cases of R being uh, pronounced as J, which are recorded in these commentaries, they all fall in the Shandong Peninsula or the immediately surrounding area. It's very striking. So, uh, as I say, we don't want to just say, well, if we can't explain something, it's a, it's a dialect uh, mixture or something like that. But where we have uh, explicit evidence like this, then, uh, well, we think we ought to use it. And that's one. Uh, another uh, is uh, uh, Laurent, was, uh, I think, was the first to suggest that um, these, uh, yeah, at least uh, these, uh, we had, wh where we had the uh, voiceless L and N, uh, these, in the past, we had said that they went to TH, and there are a lot of cases like that, uh, uh, well, for example, this word non, actually this comes from, uh, well, I'll go ahead and put the middle Chinese. This is a very clear R word, by the way. Uh, uh, over and over again, we have evidence that this uh, phonetic writes something with uh, with an R. But we also have words like this. This in, means difficult, okay. Uh, and then this is uh, tan, means uh, a beach or something like that. Middle Chinese like that. And this, then, it's very nice. This is a case of this uh, voiceless one, voiceless one going to TH. Uh, but there's also a rip, well, the name of the dynasty is uh, Han. And this is also the name of a river, which is a tributary of the uh, Yangtze River. Um, so how do we get uh, an X? out of this. Well, uh, uh, Laurent proposed uh, that uh, you had a dialect development here too with uh, these, at least these two, maybe R also, we're not sure exactly how far it went, at least I'm not. Uh, uh, this went to TH in the east and this and X in the west. Okay, uh, And in fact, uh, this, uh, if you if you draw a line, uh, well, in fact, the, the you know place names often preserve the pronunciation of the of the local pronunciation, and uh, so this is probably also to be uh, reconstructed this way, except it's got an s at the end. Uh, it's just that uh, in the coastal area, uh, this uh, n came out as a TH, and in the inland area, uh, at least in the Han River Valley, uh, it came out as a, a H. 
And uh, in fact, in an excavated text, we find this, I mean, there's a quotation from the Shi Jing in the text uh, in the Shanghai Museum, where this river name is mentioned in the Shi Jing and the character is written this way. This very character is written for, as the name of the river. So uh, then once you have this again, there, this, this is a, a hypothesis that leads you to look for other cases to either confirm or not. Uh, Laurent found uh, uh, one word that would be uh, affected is the word uh, tian for heaven uh, in Bai, which is a uh, Tibeto Burman language which borrowed words very early from Chinese. It's something like Tian. So you have the Western, this is probably Hla. Right? It could be an N, could be an Ing. Uh, so in, in Bai, which is certainly in the western area, where we would expect to find this, the word Tian is, is pronounced with a ch at the beginning. We also have an old word, way of writing uh, a, a, a word, a term for India, uh, which would, is Tianzhu. It doesn't make much sense if you read it as Tian, but if it's, in fact, uh, already something like... Uh, I think this is duk. Uh, then you, then it makes sense as a transcription of Hindu, something like that. Hindu, okay. Hinduka. 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 Okay. Uh, am I leaving something out? Well, let me give you another river name. Well, it would be. It would make sense for this to be. Well, of course, yeah. To the, be in the, the west. Yeah. India probably uh, came from the west. Yeah. Came from the west, and so that would be another. Thing there, um, uh, and uh, well, we actually have we have in the uh, Shi Ming of 200 AD. Again, I mentioned this in my talk at the Journée. Uh, well, uh, we have his explicit comment that in such and such a place, they pronounce uh, Tian with the head of the tongue. Presumably, that's this, uh, and in uh, uh, such and such other places, which is to the west and uh, more or less coincides in, in part with the Han Valley. They pronounce it with the belly of the tongue. And uh, then he gives a sound gloss for, uh, sound gloss for each one. For, uh, for the eastern one, he gives a sound gloss with that. And for the western one, he gives a sound gloss with that. Uh, so this is, uh, this is pretty darn good. Um, oh, please, do, uh, just a question for you. One, yes? Uh, I have a question concerning the evidence for the final R yes. in Nan, the top, the top character. Okay, well, uh, if you look at this, the phonetic series, one of the things, it, it's not a sure thing, but uh, I don't have it in front of me. We could look it up. But there are words written with the same phonetic, which are pronounced na, no, right? And uh, that would be, well, so na would come from, well, it'd be, in modern Chinese, it's nuo, okay? So we would have nuo from na. Middle Chinese na. Middle Chinese na. And uh, old Chinese, well, that would normally ref reflect that, uh, but that would come from earlier nar. This would be the a dialect development, okay? Uh, another example of why we would believe that this uh, dialect, uh, that it was the Shandong dialect, is there's a river in Shandong named the Yi. Okay, this is from, uh, let's see, I think it's, it must be this. Hmm? Is that right? Well, I think it is. Uh, anyway, it's pronounced e. It clearly does not have a uh, uh, an n at the end, but most of the words with this phonetic uh, do have an n at the end. But you have some mixture. So the word for for uh, flag, for instance, there's a word written that way that's qi. So again, if you have a phonetic series which has both n and the j or the reflex of j, uh, that's a tip off that it might be an r series rather than an n series, and uh, this would reflect. Uh, well, that, but coming from earlier, no, and this, and just as the Han Valley is where the, the, the initial is pronounced with an X, the 
E Valley is in the uh, in Shandong area where we believe they are changed to a J. And so, uh, again, if you don't, of course, if you don't make these hypotheses, you don't know to look for this, or you don't understand the significance of these things. It's only the, uh, by making an attempt to explain the situation that you can uh, uh, that that you get a perspective that would enable you to put these facts together in a meaningful way. And uh, the same is going to be true of the of the. Uh, well, the, the morphology, the initial morphology, the initial consonants are definitely difficult because uh, uh, for the finals we have rhymes. Uh, the finals we, can, we have an additional kind of information, namely the rhymes. Uh, the initials we have uh, don't have, the rhymes are of no help. Uh, the phonetic uh, uh, elements uh, should be help. Uh, and there have been a number of obstacles, though, to figuring out what's going on. One is that people have just used the, the script of the Shuo uh as the guide to phonetic uh, series, or phonetic compounds. Um, and if you, but of course, the, the, by that time, the language had, the, the script had already been standardized for about 300 years. Uh, and if you go be, into the pre-Chin era, you find before the standardization of the script, you find different phonetic compounds, which are much more informative about the earlier uh, time period, and uh, and they, uh, but we're only beginning to look at. It. In fact, this stuff is still being dug out of the ground and published. Uh, the other thing is that there's a wealth of information we believe in the Min dialects, in uh, Miao Yao, or Hmong Yan, in Kam uh, Tai, uh, in. Uh, Viet Mung probably, and various uh, other uh, you know sources of information like this, but these have not been traditionally exploited when doing research on old Chinese, and so the only I, I don't think we're going to solve it inductively. Uh, we're going to have to make hypotheses and check them against this evidence, and if we uh, if we are lucky, then we will find that. Uh, uh, our hypotheses begin to make the, the evidence uh, make sense, help us to make sense of the evidence. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, Laura and, and I literally last night were going through trying to make sure that our, looking at the min forms and trying to make sure that our uh, uh, reconstructions were consistent with them. We'll do that before 1.0, but, uh, but, uh, it's still, we're still sort of figuring it out. But there's got to be something happening. I mean, it's not just random stuff, right? I mean, there's these, uh, uh, these uh, softened initials uh, definitely mean something. They're, they're not just in a, a random thing. They are in a particular area. The, the dialects agree. Um, and it's, uh, it's very clear that this is something that has to, I think it's very clear that this is something that has to be uh, worked into the old Chinese reconstruction. Is it time to quit? Sven wants to ask a question. Sven. Um, regarding final N, is uh, this final R? Yes. In your 99 book, you, you brought this up and um, that you're still awaiting a statistical confirmation of whether they actually rhymed separately as claimed by Salvatin or not. So I guess that has been checked meanwhile? Uh, no. Hmm. And let me explain why. The problem is uh, there's a circularity. Uh, I mean, rhymes are one of the ways in which we decide which words have R and which words uh, have n. For example, if we see something rhyming with non, uh, we're, we, that's a reason for believing that it had an r. It doesn't prove that it had an r because there were probably already dialects where r had become n, but, but there is a fairly clear pattern. There's a certain phonetic element. This is one, this is one, this is one, this is one. Oh, I, I'll, give, I'll show you something cute about this one in a minute. Uh, all of these uh, have a very, uh, there's very good reason to believe that these uh, had a final R, but uh, it's difficult to find uh, 
a non-circular way to test it against the rhymes. With, in the case of the, the data in my book, I had, uh, so there's certain Middle Chinese readings that can only reflect one vowel. So for example, if you have something where the Middle Chinese uh, final is like that, the only possible source of that uh, has an E vowel. Okay. So I could look at the, the, the cases that were unambiguously A, O, or E, or whatever, on the basis of Middle Chinese uh, evidence, and then I could check the rhymes as an independent uh, evidence. But but in the case of this, it's it's much harder to do that because the well we could do I think you could probably do this. You could say, all right, I'm going to pick such and such phonetics uh, which are known to have uh, to write words with both n and j at the end. Okay. And uh, that's uh, quite irrespective of the rhymes. And then I'm going to look and see how those words run. Uh, I think it could be done, but it's, uh, it's still a little iffy. Um, so that, no, I haven't, I haven't figured out a good way to check this uh, statistically. But impressionistically, you see these rhyming with, it, well, this and this and this and this rhyming with each other over and over again. And so I, I don't think there's any problem about those. There still are quite a number of, of uh, items where we still have to just write a, a, an N in brackets because it's, it's still not clear where the boundary is between R and N. There are many forms that we simply, can't, that we simply don't know yet. Um, I was going to show you something cute about Chan. Uh, this is a word uh, that's uh, used in Chan Yu, uh, that is uh, used in the Shi Ji. Uh, it's supposed to be what the uh, Xiong Nu, uh, non Chinese people, called their leader. Right? Uh, by the way, there's an amusing thing about this that if you look this up in any Chinese dictionary, it will tell you to read it as Chan Yu. Uh, but for some reason, it, the, the sy Western sinologists have gotten into the habit of reading this as Shan. Uh, now, it, as, uh, it is read Shan as a surname, okay? but that's different from this, where it's, uh, it's a different tone and everything. So I've actually seen people, I've said, well, it's Chan Yu, you know, in one of these uh, online groups, and they will say, no, the standard way of reading that is Shan Yu, right? I don't care what the Chinese say. <laughs> well, anyway, so if you take this to Middle Chinese, it's uh, like this. Uh, that's Middle Chinese. And uh, this is a notorious R coda phonetic. And so this winds up being this. And this is now... Well, I'll, I don't need another one, I guess. That. Okay. Now, uh, in uh, Mongolian, there is a word for chieftain, or I'm not sure if I have the semantics exactly, daruka, which uh, means a, a chieftain or leader or something like that. And uh, I think these have to be from the same original Edamon. Now, whether it was Proto-Mongol or, or proto Xiongnu and borrowed into Mongol or Mongolian or, or what, uh, we don't know. But uh, it's, it's not because of this that we think this is, pronoun is pronounced uh, this way, that we have plenty of evidence of the same type. That is, we have uh, what looks like Old Chinese A-N and A-J in the same phonetic series. For instance, the word zhi for a, a drinking cup can be written with this phonetic. Uh, but this looks pretty good to me as a representation of daru -ga or daruwa or something like that. Yes? Well, where exactly do you get the phonetic value from? I mean, if you have a phonetic series containing n final and well, original r final turning into a one consonant final, uh, how can you tell that it has to be uh, I, I, I can't. So I, I'm, I'm hoping. 
I mean, it, basically there are some phonetics which seem to be used only to write words with a final, a middle Chinese final N. And there are others that are write, used to write only words with a, which, uh, well, the J in some uh, cases dropped in middle Chinese, but uh, look as if they write final J, okay? And then there are others which have both kinds of things in them. Okay? Uh, and moreover, if you look at the rhyme words in the Shi Jing that come from those series, they rhyme with each other ag again and again. And we find with those same words, in, in we find uh, Zheng Xuan or somebody saying, uh, the people of such and such a place uh, pronounce this uh, uh, such, such and such, and it's the same phonetic elements. So we don't know it. But. I think we have to stop here. Thank you very much. Yes. See you tomorrow. I've got to go prepare for tomorrow. <laughs> yes, that we do.